I think when it comes to the Dark Brotherhood, I will see how I feel about it as I go. So I will eliminate the target given to me, and then proceed from there. If they start urging me to give my soul to some Daedric Prince, Sithis, then I will leave and then not look back. But what if they hunt me down for abandoning them? Then I will immediately turn all my fury on their organization and do everything I can to destroy them. I am the hero that is keeping Maroon's Dagon at bay and defeated Umeral the Unfeathered. So what do I have to fear from a group of evil Daedric worshipping assassins? Well, I don't want to add any more to my plate, it's already quite full as it is. Is this a stupid decision on my part? Quite possibly. Although being promised to become a god in the future also has its perks. If that is a future that will even happen. It did get me through prison, so it will have to get me through being out of prison. The hope that one clings to sometimes is enough to push someone in a certain direction. I am not immune to losing my life. On this, I am not so deluded. What is it then? Promises of power and curiosity, I suppose. What are these stupid assassin cultists all about? I guess I'll just have to find out. As for my brother who still rules as Count in Fell's castle in High Rock, well, I received a letter back. Seems that around eight years of my last contact with him has tempered him. I am amazed that my letter not only reached him, but his has reached back to me. The couriers must be in better shape than I thought in these dark times. It reads, To my brother Malcolm, these are dark times for all of us, it would seem. Portals to Oblivion have opened up here as well, and we have had many skirmishes with them. Rumors abound of some of these gates being closed in other parts of High Rock, such as in Daggerfall. Cyrodiil is under siege, and we hear that all the other provinces are as well. We've lost only a few soldiers here at Fell's Castle, though there are a few Oblivion gates close by, and we have them watched day and night. So far, it would seem that they are waiting for something, though we know not what. Many commoners in the area have been preyed upon before we set up permanent forces to watch and attack any Daedra that try and secure our side. The king sent hundreds of knights, mages, and other soldiers through the gates, but none have been able to close them. We all just wish the situation would come to an end. It is good that you have gotten out of prison, but I was under the impression that you would be there for life. Did something happen to change that? If you have received a pardon, then I wish you all the best. Though your return here is not welcomed, please remember that. To our family name here in High Rock, you and our sister have been an embarrassment for ten years. Many of the nobility have shunned us, including the king for the most part, though he does still accept me as a vassal, and I do not wish to add any more weight to our disgraced name should you return. Regardless of your exile, you are not hated by your sister-in-law or your cousins, nor do I actually hate you. As I wrote, I wish you all the best. We are all doing well here despite the crisis, though that could change if an attack like Kavach should happen against us. We will do all we can to help hold off the enemy. Your cousins have been married off and now sit as countesses in other parts of High Rock. You now have two nephews and three nieces, and all are doing well. As it sounds, things have gotten quite busy here even before the Oblivion Gates came. Now we just wait and wait with the occasional battle. Whatever happens, I wish you all the best out there in Cyrodiil. Please make a good life out there and start a family of your own. Be happy, be wise, and don't get into any more trouble again with the law. Your brother, Count Cork Montrose of Fell's Castle. So my brother doesn't hate me, but I am in exile from the family castle, is it? I have two nephews ahead of me to inherit first. What does he think I will do, return home and kill all the male heirs so I can be the one to inherit? Korok never knew me and still doesn't know me. He's had too much of our father in him. Fine. I will gladly take my exile. I didn't want to return to the place where my father ruled anyway. Too many bad memories if I were to go back, I am sure. Out here in Cyrodiil, I am a hero, and I am doing something worthwhile. I am someone here, and I have a very good friend to help keep me company. Yeah. It's a bit late to the morning, but uh, I stayed here at Silverholm on the water. Whatever you do today, I'm sure I did. Uh, Gilgondor. 
Like Hello. Good day. Gil Gondoran, that was your name, sorry. So I spoke to the... and dealt with the Forlorn Watchman. He's now free. His spirit will no longer be seen here on Nern. The shores near Reveal are no longer haunted. Seems the ghost hasn't been sighted there any longer. Good. Good to hear. Take care. It's impressive. Ooh. I imagine he's Sir, a good brother's the You know, I need a few of these. Kamika's Westfield wine. Farewell. Bye. Okay, watch out. Silver home on the water. Not really on the water. I see you're a follower of the Grey Fox, too. You just... Quiet. And no, I'm not. Well, I guess technically I am, but... I'm not in spirit, right? I'm just doing it for revenge. Or justice, that's it. Justice. Wow, nice courtyard. Quite the castle. So, if I owned a castle and I was a count of a city, I would have something like this, though... Of course, it's Breville, everything... The stone just looks so dark and weather-beaten. It's like it was created hundreds of years ago and never replaced, and, or cleaned. But I would have more gardens than this. I would have great big flowers and gardeners to uh, keep it all looking nice. I mean, this is all right. But... Wow, it just keeps going and going. Not bad, but uh, very defensible too. But I just don't understand. Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, he holds court right here, does he? Very strange layout. Uh, hello, my lord. I am Malcolm Malcolm Durrell. I am Malcolm Durrell, hero of Kavach. I am here to see if you have any work for me. Well met. I take it you don't have any work for me. Well, what can you tell me about your fine town? Yes, yes, Count of Breville. Are you a foreigner? And do yourself a favor. Learn the basics about the places you visit. <laughs> there. Problem solved. How patronizing. Thank you, my lord. I shall take my leave, then. Idiot. Perhaps his brother was the smart one. The one that was murdered. Alright, well, I think that that's everything for uh, this town, for Breville. Somebody's killing cats, and Fergus isn't even here. <laughs> okay. So, where is... We need to go to the Mages Guild. Which... Where, where is the Mages Guild? Straight ahead. Good to see you. Oh. Monster. Somebody's killing cats, somebody's killing a Khajiit. See, that's what lead, That's what happens with cat killing. It leads to killing Khajiits. Trishanji's dead. After I went and helped him out, too. How well, strange. So what Let's get out of here. I really would like to go to Leowin. Alright, so we have to find out where this Khajiit woman is. Hopefully somebody that's out there killing cats hasn't killed her. Scrivia has asked me to retrieve a ring that belongs to Andarji. She is a Khajiit living in Leowen. I need to go to Leowen and see if I can find her. Alright, so let's look for the Khajiit females. Uh, hopefully. You're not female. There's one over there, though. Guildmate. Hello. Good day. Oh, uh, you're not the one I'm looking for. Uh, Andarji. I'm looking for Andarji. Bye. These giant rats just in the middle of town. Maybe we could visit the data sky. Huh? Some of the statues are really funny. I I don't know what you just said. There's another female. Hi there. Oh. She went in. Greetings. I don't know where this woman is. If you can call Khajiit a woman, I don't know. Good morning. Excuse me. Uh, 
Hello? I can eat for a day with a single coin. Ah, beggar. Listen, do you know where and and uh, is? She lives on the west side of town. She is fond of the three sisters in the evening, but takes her midday meal at the five claws. Okay. Blessings of Stendar upon you. Yes, blessing of Stendar upon you. So she has a house on the east side of town. Let's go there. With the size of these rats, you can make a a meal for a whole family. Was this it? I think this was it. She's not here. No one's answering the door. Well, she said she takes her meals. Well, it's lunchtime. How would a beggar know the schedule of somebody? Very odd. Alright, so, she says she's fond of three sisters in the evening. That would be the Kajiti sisters, wherever they are. House for sale. Three sisters in. So, she shouldn't be there, but then there's another inn that's over here. Is it the Dividing Line or Five Claws Lodge? For all I know, she's out shopping or she's visiting someone. Let's try this other inn, because I'm pretty sure she said she goes to Three Sisters in the evening. The Dividing Line is not an inn, or a place to eat. Five Claw Lodges. Now, wasn't this where I, I broke up that fight that the Fighters Guild was well, trying to start? What is it now? You look like what have you been up to? Come from the the I ran across a couple of months. Well, it's a place to eat, alright, but... Hello? Goblins. Hello? A pleasure to speak with you. Uh, I'm not looking for a bed. I'm looking for a Darji. How do you do? Hello. Julita Plotius. I'm Beto's wife. I have no idea who that is. Um, can you tell me about Leowen? Well, I don't know much about politics, but I think Lady Alicia's right. We've got to put a stop to all these bandits and rabble in the Transnibbon. Well, that only makes sense. I know sense. the Kajit are all upset that the Council took away their land and gave it to us. But they just have to get over it. It's our land now. No. Oh, I wasn't even aware of that, actually. Actually, that's not true. I had just forgotten. It's been ages since I've heard that. Uh, Hello. Beto Plotius. Oh. I'm a faithful servant of Leowen and the Emperor. God's rest his soul. I guess I know who your wife is. What can you tell me about Leowen? I've lived in Leowen all my life, and I must say... The Count has found himself a pretty little bride. And a smart one, too. Yeah, she's not we bad looking. Need some law and order. Bring in the legions. Leowin for the Imperials, I say. No sense coddling those Ren Redra Crin bandits. The what? Crim bandits? I don't even know what that means. Let's try the three sisters then. Because I'm not having any luck where I'm going. But yeah, it only makes sense. We uh, definitely dealt with any bandits in our kingdom. In High Rock. If it gets out of hand, then uh, there today? goes your trade and people's you confidence in your leadership. Uh, who are you? Oh, you're not Khajiit. It looks... Hello? Why does the prey approach me? The prey? <laughs> you are a Darji, are you? So, can you tell me about your stolen ring? Yes. A filthy Argonian stole my precious ring. It was a gift from my mate. It has sentimental value. I will pay well. The stupid lizard hunts with the name Amusai. Find him, find my ring. Make him suffer. Kill him and I will be pleased. Oh, hey, hey. I'm not going to do something that's going to get me in trouble here. The guild frowns on killing. Stupid guild rules. He is only an Argonian. He is less than human and much less than Khajiit. Okay, I don't like the way you're spare talking. spare him. At least make him suffer. You're just angry. Hmm. I know a lot of people that think the beast races are less than human. So... <sighs> I've heard enough. Swift. <laughs> Very interesting, uh, hair. You look like quite the alchemist. Okay, so, he wants me to, she wants me to kill this 
Amusai. I don't know if I've heard of that name before. She's just offering a hundred gold for it? You know, if I was going to do something like killing him, I would... A thousand, at least. Adarji is offering me... I'll have to look around for him, which means speaking to other... Argonians. How about mixing Hello. up some... I hope I can help. Hello? Oh, you don't know Amusai? How are you? Hello. It's my pleasure. Please continue. Oh, she has not heard of Amusai. Well, it's not really good because a lot of these people are travelers. I don't know the area too well. Hello? I'm Otumil, but I didn't do anything, really. It wasn't me. Uh... <laughs> no, really? It wasn't me. Never. You sound a little defensive and not very intelligent on top of it. If you're saying that, when I just say hello to you. Now, uh, what can you tell me about Leowin? Okay, okay, I'll tell you. It's so great. I sneak into people's houses, take things off their tables and shelves, and put them into barrels. <laughs> Isn't that rich? They think the things are stolen, but no. <laughs> they are right there. They just don't know. Stop it! That's my kind of humor. <laughs> That's ridiculous. That is about the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of in my life. You waste your time doing that. <laughs> Although I wouldn't mind doing that to a certain Hieronymus Lex on a daily basis, but hiding it. Making him search for days for all of his... Even his gear he wears as he goes around the city. Oh, you look like a well-to-do Argonian. Hello. I am Mahai. That poor fellow who is chased everywhere by that nagging fishwife, Numin. Please, just don't mention me to her, huh? or she will burst into one of her tirades. Okay. You, you train. Let's see if we can't uh, teach you a thing. I don't need any training in that area of athletics. What can you tell me about Leowen? There are things I like to do. Does this never occur to her? Does she think I live each minute to run her errands for her? She wonders why she cannot find me? Doesn't it occur to her that I am hiding from her? All right. Tell, sounds like marital problems to me. You too. Hello. Good day. You know anything about Amusai? No, she says. Okay, so Leowen, what do you tell me about Leowen? Blackwood Company is putting the Fighters Guild to shame. They're a new mercenary company competing with the Guild. Beast people and others savages work cheap and fast. No job too tough. Not fussy either. Fighters Guild better watch out. All right then. Be seeing you. Well, I'm gonna have to look to see if there's not an ami. Uh. Hello, who are you? Ah, me children will thank you for your help. Well, that last beggar helped me. Do you know Amusai? The poor bugger was arrested. Oh. Seems he tried to swindle the Countess. He's rotting in a cell in the castle dungeon now. It's common knowledge that the jailers can be bribed to allow visitors to see prisoners. It's common knowledge, huh? Okay. Well, I've spent a night... Actually, it was two days in that jail. I guess I know where to go, then, to find Amisai. All I need is this ring. The things I have to do to get in better reputation with the Thieves' Guild. Break into people's houses. Steal things that are... Quite below me. I mean, just the act of thieving is not something I like to do. But these items are just not ver worth very much. I can get one... Daedric, I, any piece, and sell it for more than everything I've already fenced for the Thieves' Guild. Okay, well, Mazoga's moved on. Well, Don't worry about seeing that ugly, smelly orc. I'm listening, please. I think seeing the Count is not how you do this. Let's go down to the dungeons. Okay, well, I guess I have to grease some palms. Hello. You're not supposed to be down here. I'm here to see Amusai. Will you take a donation? Yeah, we got him here. Argonians aren't allowed visitors, though. Countess Alicia's orders. 
such is the thing about the lizard folk. Not even for 20 gold coins. Amu say, you say? <laughs> I thought you wanted to, to see Amu day. He's off limits. Amu say, though, is just down the hall. Uh, make it quick. Uh, okay. That was a terrible, I have terrible comeback. Job. Just down the hall. Where's the actual prison? Where's the bars? Where's... Oh, must have missed that room. Here we go. Yeah, this is where I was. Are you Amu say? What do you want? <coughs> Excuse me. How did you end up in Leowen? The Thieves Guild refused to take me, so I came here. Leowen is my home. It is where I was raised. <sighs> I went to the Imperial City in hopes of joining the Thieves' Guild. Now, I am forced to live as a freelance thief. Yes, well, good luck with that, but uh, I'm here for Adarji's ring. Why should I tell you where it is? I'll pay you for here it. Here I sit in Leowin's dungeon while you are free. What will you do for Amusai if I tell you? Huh. What if I give you a lockpick? You do that for me? Maybe you guild types aren't so bad after all. Okay, it's a deal. Give me a lockpick and I'll tell you about the ring. Here, take this lockpick. Sunlit freedom. Yes, I stole that ring from a daiji. When I went to sell it, the fence told me I was too hot for him. He showed me an inscription on the inside, to Alessia. That had to be the Countess of Leowin. The damn ring was stolen property. Well, I figured I would ransom it back to the Countess, except she tricked me. I was arrested for theft, and she kept the ring. Well, the Countess rarely leaves the castle. Good luck getting it back. Maybe I could talk her into it. I owe you a debt of gratitude. Just don't say anything. That's what we thieves, I guess I am one, we in the Thieves Guild have to do is just uh, keep our mouths shut. So, thankfully, I had an extra key, not the skeleton key. You look lost. Well, I guess I better... Uh, <clears throat> I wish I had a charm spell, but I'll use my natural charm. Hello, oh Countess. My. I'm here to see you. Are Hello, you my lord. Adventurer? Yes? Uh, I've, rec uh, I've recovered a Karo family ring. I don't answer questions about royal jewelry from riffraff like you. Oh. Uh, sorry, you have recovered the Karo ring, family ring, and I am looking for it. I guess she's still a little upset over that dinner party she had. Yes? Okay, so let's get to know each other a little better, shall we? Is that... you're full of it. Oh, <laughs> that... you're too kind. How not? You can't... you're path. I like that a lot. That's great. I like. It. You're a big fat. L You're full of it. Oh, <laughs> that. I like it. You. you can't scare me. Blah blah. blah. That's real. It's good of you. Oh please. Is that? Blah. blah. That's. You're too kind. It's good of you. Oh, you're pathetic. I like that a lot. Don't make me. L That's real. How nice. Every little I see. Okay, sorry. So you've recovered the Cairo family ring. Can we talk about this now? Yes. After all these years, I have my ring back. I wear it all the time now. Of course not when I sleep. I am a proper lady after all. You take your rings off when you go to sleep. Okay. Interesting. Uh, why does Adarji want the ring back? 
So I guess that would be a good time. This is a Thieves Guild quest, after all. To take the ring from her. Uh, uh, what can you tell me about Leowen, my lady? In these difficult times, we must count on persons such as you to secure our borders from bandits and rabble-rousers. We all profit by your lawful pursuit of the unlawful, and we encourage you to attack, burn, loot, and destroy them wherever you can. Heard any good rumors lately? Legion duty here in Cyrodiil is usually a dull affair. In the East, though, things are a bit more challenging, and one can make a name for oneself. You mean in Morrowind? Huh. Farewell. Farewell. What is the time? So, I will have to go up... Which is up on the balcony above. That leads to their private quarters. And I will want to do this, probably without anybody else with me. Although I didn't I did sneak made a good to see money. Hieronymus Lex, so... How are you? With my companions. Why does she want that ring so badly? Uh, the ring was inscribed on the inside with the name Alessia Carroll, a.k.a. Countess of Leowin. Apparently, he tried to sell it back to her. When he went to deliver the ring, this is from, uh, Amusai. So, why does Adarji want the ring so badly? Oh. I just don't even want to think about it. How it's a job. It'll get me in better with the Rain Thieves Guild. The That's the only thing I could care about. All right, so I'm curious to know what Adarji would have to say about this. Oh, here you are. Why does the prey approach me? Okay, I have found out where you, what happened to your ring. Does the hunter have this one's ring? No. Amusai tried to sell it back to Alessia Caro. Amusai tried to sell it to Alessia Caro. Ah, stupid lizard. Adarji uses the ring much more wisely. I use it to collect and sell information. That ring can be used to read private messages that count rights. <laughs> Get me that ring. Interesting. Steal it from Alicia Caro if necessary. Just bring me the ring. Okay. I will pay double. I knew it was going here anyways. Anything else you can tell me about that ring? Does the hunter have this one's ring? Not yet. I don't have it yet. Well then, it seems you still have a job to do. What can you tell me about Leowen? So many green skins here, they smell, do they not? Hadarji won't drink the water. No, the Argonians swim in it. <laughs> okay. What do you uh, train? You've got a lot to learn. Light armor, okay. Swift hunting. Well, I've got to, uh... It's you. Hi. Waste some time here. The Finders Guild thing at Desolate Mine went perfectly, didn't it? Cleared out the goblins and no one got We've got to stay here until it's dark. Hello. Preferably midnight. Greetings, Brett. I got nothing to sell. Uh, apparently there's no work here in the Fighters Guild, which is strange. Well, I don't know what to do. I mean, I can go and just read a book, I guess. Yeah, I do have the fourth volume. Of the, uh... That was the strangest book I ever read. What book? Oh, yeah? Anything I can do for you? Why don't you just talk? Of course. Is there anything in particular that you would like to discuss? I know your flowers are. They're around Skingrad, so we'll, we'll... We'll go there at some point. Uh... Tell me about yourself. When I was at home in Sonstein, we often spent cozy evenings at home. My parents and my brothers and sisters and I. We used to eat herring, drink lots of mead, and sing traditional Nord songs. I might sing them for you one of these days. Let's I'm start. Sure you like them. Go ahead. Then we used to play some traditional Nord games as well. Like arm wrestling. I was quite good at it actually. Better than my brothers. We could do some arm wrestling one of these days if you like. Well, arm rest but, resting. Uh, I warn you right now, uh, I have been practicing. It's arm a lot, wrestling. So don't be surprised if I win. Okay. Um, I'm surprised you guys didn't do activities like swimming in the ice cold water. 
Talk later. Alright, so time to read. Ilya and Fer uh, Wolfgang will do their own thing. Where is that book? The Real Baron Zaya, Part 4. Ah, oh, it's fair size. Uh, everything I have ever loved, I have lost. Baron Zaya thought despondently, looking at the mounted knights behind and ahead, her tire woman near her in a carriage. Yet I have gained a measure of wealth and power, and the promise of more to come. Dearly have I bought it. Now I do understand better Tiber Septim's love of it, if he had often paid such prices. For surely worth is measured by the price we pay. By her wish, she rode on a shiny roan mare, clad as a warrior in a resplendent chain mail of dark elven make. As the days slowly slipped by, and her train rode the winding road eastward into the setting sun, around her gradually rose the steep-sided mountain slopes of Morrowind. The air was thin, and a chill late autumn wind blew constantly, but it was also rich with the sweet spicy smell of the late-blooming black rose, which was native to Morrowind and grew in every shadowy nook and crevice of its highlands, finding nourishment even in the stoniest banks and ridges. In small villages and towns, ragged dark elven folk gathered along the road to cry her name or simply gape. Most of her knightly escort were redguards, with a few high elves, nords, and bretons. As they wove their way into the heart of Morrowind, they grew increasingly uncomfortable and clung together in protective clusters. Even the elven knights seemed wary. But Baron Zaya felt at home, at last. She felt the welcome extended to her by the land, her land. Symmachus met her at the Mournhold border with an escort of knights, about half of whom were dark elven. In imperial battle dress, she noted. There was a grand parade of entry into the city and speeches of welcome from stately dignitaries. I've had the queen's suite refurbished for you, the general told her later when they reached the palace, but you may change anything not to your taste, of course. He went on about the details of the coronation, which was to be held in a week. He was his old commanding self, but she sensed something else as well. He was eager for her approval of the arrangements, was in fact fishing for it. That was new. He had never required her commendation before. He asked her nothing about her stay in the Imperial City, or of her affair with Tiber Septim, although Baron Zaya was certain Drelian had told him, or earlier written him, everything in detail. The ceremony itself, like so much else, was a mixture of old and new, parts of it from the ancient dark elven tradition of Mournhold, the others dictated by imperial decree. She was sworn to the service of the Empire and Tiber Septim as well as to the land of Mournhold and its people. She accepted oaths of fealty and allegiance from the people, the nobility and the council. The last was composed of a blend of imperial emissaries, advisors they were called, and native representatives of the Mournhold people, who were mostly elders in accordance with elven custom. Baron Zaya later found that much of her time was occupied in attempting to reconcile these two factions and their cronies. The elders were expected to do most of the conciliating in light of reforms introduced by the Empire, pertaining to land ownership and surface farming. But most of these went clean against dark elven observances. Tiber Septim, in the name of the One, had ordained a new tradition, and apparently even the gods and goddesses themselves were expected to obey. The new queen threw herself into her work and her studies. She was through with love and men for a long, long time, if not forever. There were other pleasures, she discovered, as Symmachus had promised her long ago. Those of the mind, and those of power. Ah, she's getting into my realm now. She developed surprisingly, for she had always rebelled against her tutors at the Imperial City, a deep love for dark elven history and mythology, a hunger to know more fully the people from whom she had sprung. She was gratified to learn that they had been proud warriors and skilled craftsmen and cunning mages since time immemorial. Tiber Septim lived for another half-century, during which she saw him on several occasions as she was bidden to the Imperial City on one reason of state or another. He greeted her with warmth during these visits, and they even had long talks together about events in the Empire when opportunity would permit. 
He seemed to have quite forgotten that there had ever been anything between them, more than easy friendship and a profound political alliance. He changed little as the years passed. Rumor had it that his mages had developed spells to extend his vitality, and that even the one had granted him immortality. Then one day a messenger came with the news that Tupper Septim was dead, and his grandson, Pelagius, was now emperor in his place. They had heard the news in private, she and Symmachus. The sometimes imperial general and now her trusted prime minister took it stoically as he took most everything. Somehow it doesn't seem possible, Baron Zai said. I told you, I. it's the way of humans. They are a short-lived people. It doesn't really matter. His power lives on and his son now wields it. You called him your friend once. Do you feel nothing? No grief? He shrugged. There was a time when you called him somewhat more. What do you feel, Baron Zaya? They had long ago ceased to address each other in private by their formal titles. Emptiness. Loneliness, she said. Then she too shrugged. But that's not new. Aye, I know, he said softly, taking her hand. Baron Zaya, he turned her face up and kissed her. The act filled her with astonishment. She couldn't remember ever touching her, him, his ever touching her before. She'd never thought of him in that way, and yet, undeniably, an old familiar warmth spread through her. She'd forgotten how good it felt, that warmth, not the scorching heat she'd felt with Tiber Septum, but the comforting, robust ardor she somehow associated with with straw. Straw. Poor straw. She hadn't thought of him in so long. He'd be middle-aged now if he were still alive. Probably with a dozen children, she thought affectionately, and a hearty wife who hopefully could talk for two. <laughs> yeah, since T Symmachus took his tongue. Marry me, Baron Zaya, Symmachus was saying. He seemed to have picked up her thoughts on marriage, children, wives. I've worked and toiled and waited long enough, haven't I? Marriage. A peasant with peasant dreams. The thought appeared in her mind, clear and unbidden. Hadn't she used those very same words to describe straw so very long ago? And yet, why not? If not, not Symmachus, then who else? Many of the great noble families of Morrowind had been wiped out in Tiber Septim's great war of unification before the treaty. Dark Elven rule had been restored, it was true, but not the old, not the true nobility. Most of them were upstarts like Symmachus, and not even half as good or deserving as he was. He had fought to keep Mournhold whole and hale when their so-called counselors would have picked at its bones, sucked them dry as Ebenhard had been sucked dry. He'd fought for Mournhold, fought for her, while she and the kingdom grew and thrived. She felt a sudden rush of gratitude and, undeniably, affection. He was steady and reliable, and he'd served her well, and loved her well. Why not, she said, smiling, and took his hand and kissed him. The union was a good one, in its political as well as personal aspects. While Tiber Septim's grandson, the Emperor Pelagius I, viewed her with a jaundiced eye, his trust in his father's old friend was absolute. Symmachus, however, was still viewed with suspicion by Morrowind's stiff-necked folk, cherry at his peasant ancestry and his close ties to the Empire. But the Queen was quite unshakably popular, the Lady Baron Zaya is one of our own, it was whispered, held captive as we. Baron Zaya felt content. There was work and there was pleasure, and what more could one ask of life? The years passed swiftly, with crises to be dealt with, and storms and famines and failures to be weathered, and plots to be foiled, and conspirators to be executed. Mournhold prospered steadily. Her people were secure and fed, her mines and farms productive. All was well save that the royal marriage had produced no children, no heirs. Elven children are slow to come and most demanding of their welcome, and noble children more so than others. Thus many decades had come to pass before they grew concerned. The fault lies with me, Symmachus. I'm damaged goods, Baron Zaya said bitterly. If you want to take another, I want no other, Symmachus said gently. Nor do I know for certain that the fault is yours. Perhaps it is mine. Aye, whichever, we will seek a cure. If there is damage, surely it may be repaired. How so, when we dare not entrust anyone with the true story? Healer's oaths do not always hold. It won't matter if we change the time and circumstances a bit. Whatever we say or fail to say, Geoffrey, the storyteller, never rests. The god's inventive mind and quick tongue are ever busy spreading gossip and rumor. 
Priests and healers and mages came and went, but all their prayers, potions, and philtries produced not even a promise of bloom, let alone a single fruit. Eventually they thrust it from their minds and left it in the gods' hands. They were yet young as elves went, with centuries ahead of them. There was time. With elves there was always time. Baron Zaya sat at dinner in the great hall, pushing food about on a plate, feeling bored and restless. Symmachus was away, having been summoned to the Imperial City by Tabor Septim's great-great-grandson, Uriel Septim. Or was it his great-great-great-grandson? She'd lost count, she realized. Their faces seemed to blur one into the next. Perhaps she should have gone with him, but there had been the delegation from Tyr on a tiresome matter that nevertheless required delicate handling. A bard was singing in an alcove off the hall, but Berenziah wasn't listening. Lately, all the songs seemed the same to her, whether new or old. Then a turn of phrase caught her attention. He was singing of freedom, of adventure, of freeing Morrowind from its change. How dare he! Baron Zaya sat straight and turned to glare at him. Worse, she realized he was singing of some ancient and now immaterial war with the Skyrim Nords, praising the heroism of kings Edward and Morlane and their brave companions. The tale was old enough, certainly, yet the song was new and its meaning, Baron Zaya couldn't be sure. A bold fellow, this bard, but with a strong, passionate voice and a good ear for music. Rather handsome, too, in a raffish sort of way. He didn't look to be well off, exactly, nor was he all that young. Certainly, he couldn't be under a century of age. Why hadn't she heard him before, or at least heard of him? Who is he? she inquired of a lady-in-waiting. The woman shrugged and said, Calls himself the Nightingale, my lady. No one seems to know anything about him. Bid him speak with me when he was done. The man called the Nightingale came to her, thanked her for the honor of the Queen's audience, and the fat purse she handed him. His manner wasn't bold at all, she decided, rather quiet and unassuming. He was quick enough with gossip about others, but she learned nothing about him. He turned all questions away with a joking repost or a ribald tale. Yet these were recounted so charmingly it was impossible to take offense. My true name, my lady? I am no one. No, no, my parents named me No Wan. Or was it No Buddy? What matters it? It matters not. How many parents give name to that which they know not? Ah, I believe that was the name. No, not. I have been the Nightingale for so long, I do not remember since, oh, last month at the very least, or was it last week? All my memory goes into song and tale, you see, my lady. I have none left for myself. I am really quite dull. Where was I born? Why? Nowhere. I plan to settle in Dunronum, Roman, when I get there, but I am in no hurry. I see, and will you then marry Atalshire? Very perceptive of you, my lady. Perhaps, perhaps, although I find in haste quite charming too, at Wiles. Ah, you are fickle then. Like the wind, milady, I blow hither and yon, hot and cold, as chance suits. Chance is my suit. Naught else wears well on me. Baron's eyes smiled. Stay with us a while, then, if you will, my lord, or hat-tick. As you wish, milady bright. After that brief exchange, Baron's eye found her interest in life somehow rekindled. All that had seemed stale became fresh and new again. She created each day with zest looking forward to conversation with the Nightingale and the gift of his song. Unlike other bards, he never sang her praises, nor other women's, but only of high adventure and bold deeds. When she asked him about this, he said, What greater praise of your beauty could you ask, milady, that, than that which your own mirror gives you? And if words you would have, you have those of the greatest of those greater than my callow self. How should I vie with them, I who was born but a week gone by? For once they were speaking privately. The queen, unable to sleep, had summoned him to her chamber that his music might soothe her. You are lazy and a coward, Sarah, else I held no charm for you. Milady, to praise you, I must know you. I can never know you. You are wrapped in enigma, in clouds of enchantment. Is she basically telling him to sleep with her? Nay, not so. Your words are what weave enchantment. Your words, and your eyes, and your body. Know me if you will. Know me if you dare. And there it is. In each book, there is something like that. It's all about the sex, you see. <laughs> he came to her then. They lay close. They kissed. They embraced. 
Not even Baron Zaya truly knows Baron Zaya, he whispered softly. So how may I? Milady, you seek and know it not, nor yet for what? What would you have that you have not? Passion, she answered back. Passion, and children born of it. And for your children, what? What birthright might be theirs? Freedom, she said. The freedom to be what they would be. Tell me, you who seem wisest to these eyes and ears and the soul that knits them, where might I find these things? One lies beside you, the other beneath you. But would you dare stretch out your hand that you might take what you could be yours and your children's? Symmachus, in my person lies the answer to part of what you seek. The other lies hidden below us in these your very kingdom's minds, that which will grant us the power to fulfill and achieve our dreams, that which Edward and Moraine between them used to free High Rock and their spirits from the hateful dom domination of the Nords. If it be properly used, my lady, none may stand against it, not even the power the Emperor controls. Freedom, you say? Baron Zaya, freedom it gives from the chains that bind you. Think on it, my lady. He kissed her again softly and withdrew. You're not leaving, she cried out, her body yearned for him. For now, he said, pleasures of the flesh are nothing beside what we might have together. I would have you think on what I just said. I don't need to think. What must we do? What preparations must be made? Why, none. The mines may not be entered freely, it is true, but with the queen at my side, who will stand athwart, once below I can guide you to where this thing lies and lift it from its resting place. Then the memory of her endless studies slid into place. The horn of summoning, she whispered in awe. Is it true? Could it be? How do you know? I've read that it's buried beneath the measureless caves of Daggerfall. Nay, long have I studied this matter, ere his death King Edward gave the horn for safekeeping into the hand of his old friend King Morlane. He in turn secreted it here in Mornhold under the guardianship of the god Ethan, whose birthplace and Ballywick this is. Now you know what it has cost me many a long year and a weary mile to discover. But the god, what of Ethan? Trust me, my lady heart, all will be well. Laughing softly, he blew her a last kiss and was gone. On the morrow, they passed the guards at the great portals that led into the mines, and further below, under pretense of her customary, customary tour of inspection, Baron's eye unattended but for the nettingale, ventured into cavern after subterranean cavern. Eventually, they reached what looked like a forgotten sealed doorway, and upon entering, found that it led to an ancient part of the workings, long abandoned. The going was treacherous for some of the old shafts had collapsed, and they had to clear a passage through the rubble or find a way around the more impassable piles. Vicious rats and huge spiders scurried here and there, sometimes even attacking them. But they proved no match for Baron Zaya's firebolt spells or the Nightingale's quick dagger. We've been gone too long, Baron Zaya said at length. They'll be looking for us. What will I tell them? Whatever you please, the Nightingale laughed. You are the queen, aren't you? The Lord Symmachus, that peasant obey whoever holds power, always has, always will. We shall hold the power, my lady. Love? His lips are sweet as wine, his touch both fire and ice. Now, she said, take me now, I'm ready. Her body seemed to hum, every nerve and muscle taut. Not yet, not here, not like this. He waved around, indicating the aged dusty debris and grim walls of rock. Just a little while longer, reluctantly, Baron Zaya nodded her ascent. They resumed walking. Here, he said at last, pausing before a blank barrier. Here it lies. He scratched a rune in the dust, his other hand weaving a spell as he did so. The wall dissolved. It revealed an entrance to some ancient shrine. In the midst stood a statue of a god, hammer in hand, poised above an adamantium anvil. By my blood, Ethan, the nightingale cried. <sighs> I bid thee waken, Morlane's heir of even heart am I, last of the royal line, sharer of thy blood. At Morrowind's last need, with all of Elvendom in dread peril of their selves and souls, release me to that guerdon which thou guardest. Now I do bid thee strike. At his final words, the statue glowed and quickened. The blank stone eyes shone a bright red. The massive head nodded. The hammer smote the anvil, and it split asunder with a thunderous crash. The stone god itself, stone god itself, crumbling. Baron Zaya clapped her hands over her ears and crouched down, shaking terribly and moaning out loud. 
The Nightingale strode forward boldly and clasped the thing that lay among the ruins with a roar of ecstasy. He lifted it high. Someone's coming! Baron Zaya cried in alarm, then noticed for the first time what it was he was holding aloft. Wait, that's not the horn. It, it's a staff. Indeed, milady, you see truly at last. The Nightingale laughed aloud. I am sorry, milady, sweet, but I must leave you now. Perhaps we shall meet again one day. Until then, ah, until then, Symmachus, he said to the mail-clad figure who had appeared behind them. She is all yours. You may claim her back. No, Baron Zaya screamed. She sprang up and ran towards him, but he was gone, winked out of existence. Just as Symmachus, Claymore drawn, reached him. His blade cleaved a single stroke through empty air. Then he stood still, as if taking the stone god's place. Baron Zaya said nothing, heard nothing, saw nothing, felt nothing. Symmachus told the half dozen or so elves who had accompanied him that the Nightingale and Queen Baron Zaya had lost their way and had been set upon by giant spiders that the nightingale had lost his footing and fallen into a deep crevice, which closed over him, that his body could not be recovered, that the queen had been badly shaken by the encounter and more deeply mourned the loss of her friend, who had fallen in her defense. Such was Symmachus's presence and power of command that the slack-jawed knights, none of whom had caught more than a glimpse of what happened, were convinced that it was all exactly as he said. The queen was escorted back to the palace and taken to her chamber, whereupon she dismissed her servants in waiting. She sat still before her mirror for a long time, stunned, too distraught even to weep. Symmachus stood watching over her. Do you have any idea at all what you have just done? He said finally, flatly, coldly. You should have told me, Baron Zai whispered. The Staff of Chaos. I never dreamed it lay here. He said, he said, a mewling escaped her lips and she doubled over in despair. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? What happens now? What's to become of me, of us? Did you love him? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, my Symmachus, the gods have mercy on me. But I did love him. Did. But now? Now? I don't know. I'm not sure. I... Symmachus' hard-lined face softened slightly, and his eyes glittered with new light, and he sighed. <sighs> I... that's something, then. You will become a mother yet, if it's within my powers. As for the rest, Baron Zaya, my dearest Baron Zaya, I expected you have loosed a storm upon the land. It'll be a while yet in the brewing, but when it comes, we'll weather it together, as we always have. He came over to her then, and stripped her of her clothing, and carried her to the bed. Out of grief and longing, her enfeebled body responded to his brawny one, as it never had before, pouring forth all that the nightingale had wakened to life in her and in so doing, calming the restless ghosts of all he had destroyed. She was empty and emptied, and then she was filled, for a child was planted and grew within her. As her son flourished in the womb, so did her feeling toward patient, faithful, devoted Symmachus, which had been rooted in long friendship and unbroken affection, and which now at last ripened into the fullness of true love. Eight years later, they were blessed, again blessed, this time with a daughter. Actually, I didn't know she had a daughter. I knew she had the son. Directly after the Nightingale's theft of the Staff of Chaos, Symmachus had sent urgent secret communiques to Uriel's septum. He had not gone himself as he would normally have, choosing instead to stay with Baron Zaya during her fertile period to father a son upon her. For this, and for the theft, he suffered Uriel's septum's temporary disfavor and unjust suspicion. Spies were sent in search of the thief, but the Nightingale seemed to have vanished whence he had come. Wherever that was, seems sort of like a Didric Prince type thing, or perhaps a champion for one of them. Dark elf in part, perhaps, and Baron Zaya, but part human too, I think, in disguise, else I would not have come so quickly to fertility. <laughs> part dark elf for sure, and of ancient Ray Atham lineage at that, else he would not have been able to free the staff, Symmachus reasoned. He turned to peer at her fixedly. I don't think he would have lain with you. As an elf, he did not dare, for then he would not have been able to part from you. He smiled. Then he turned serious once more. Aye, he knew the staff lay there, not the horn, and that he must teleport to safety. The staff is not a weapon that would have seen him clear, unlike the horn. Praise the gods, at least, that he does not have that. It seems all was as he expected, but how did he know? 
I placed the staff there myself, with the aid of the ragtail end of the Rayatham clan, who now sits king in Castle Ebenhart as a reward. Tabor Septim claimed the horn, but left the staff for safekeeping. I.e., now the Nightingale can use the staff to sow seeds of strife and dissension wherever he goes, if he wishes. Yet that alone will not gain him power. That lies with the horn and the ability to use it. I'm not so sure it power, it's power the Nightingale seeks, Berenzai said. All seek power, Simaka said, each in our own way. Not I, she answered. I, my lord, have found that for which I sought. Oh. If there was a, maybe another paragraph, that could have been a happy ending to the story, but... There's another book, and I'll have to read it sometime. So, let's uh, just rest for now, and then we can go and try to steal that ring. I'm not looking forward to this, because this kind of thing is very dangerous, and I'm not really that great at sneaking around. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.